right, welcome to the podcast, Paul. Excellent. It's great to be here. <laughs> well, uh, I want you to start out by just telling me, as if I was like a, I don't know you, just give me a brief bio of yourself before first principles. Okay. Obviously, we're here to talk about first principles. Anybody's going to know that, but tell me like about you, Paul. Me, Paul. Well, I, I grew up in roughly this area. You know, I was uh, uh, not far away, probably 20 minutes away from the, the church body now. So, like, it, it's, a, it's not an origin story, but it's a coming back home sort of story. Uh, so I grew up in Carrollton area and, um, you know, was, you know, to sum up a lot of the early portions of my life, you know, college, developmental stuff, all of that, I... I left. I was like, I'm never coming back. Like, I don't want this area. You know, my, you know, <laughs> even though my family and stuff were around. I feel like that's so many people's story. Yeah. Like, well, I don't want to live here. I've, and then somehow I moved back here. <laughs> yeah. I've said it so many times. I was like, I'm going to show this town my rearview mirror and never coming back. Well, you get married. You know, I, I took a, I did a stint in the military. Um, and there's nothing like being away to make you realize that you love it. So, um, so I came back home. Um, the, the military will we'll gloss over that. That was a big part of my life. Um, but I met my wife. I had my kids while I was out, um, uh, you know, in other countries, in other parts of the world. And um, I come back and I was in this phase where I needed to learn uh, who I was and who I was going to be and, and what I wanted. And, you know, I thought that was an entrepreneurial journey. And I thought it was all about, you know, money for me. Like that's, I was like, not that I was chasing it, but it was like, this is how I'm going to serve the kingdom. You know, I think guys in the Bible, I think, you know, the Abrahams, the Jobs, like there, there are some outstandingly wealthy people in the Bible. And I was like, that's like, I resonate with making money. Like, that's good. You they know? also lived a couple hundred years. Yeah. So. They also did. They had, they had time to accumulate. <laughs> they had some time to accumulate. Oh, man. So, uh, well, I don't At have that much. Yeah. So I, I, I should have got started younger, maybe. But anyways, um, yeah, I... So with that in mind, I was doing all of this, I'll say self-help stuff, you know, uh, I was doing a lot of Bible studies, you know, I had a core group of men that I fell in with at a local church and, um, and was really finding myself, you know, I come back out of that, um, you know, the whole of COVID years happened, I'm glossing over a lot of, a lot of areas here, but COVID happened and that, um, drove me to salt and light. I need community in my church. I need people um, you know, there's part of every man. I think it's like, I'm a loner. I want to do it on my own. I want to venture off into the wilderness. I still need people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we all do. And, and when you made the decision, the bold decision to uh, keep the church open, uh, me, my father-in-law, the rest of my family, of course, my wife, you know, we're like, there we go. We need people. We, we need, there's some, people there. Yeah. We we're, need people. We're going, <laughs> we're going. And Jerry loves telling the story. He goes, I walked up the stairs the first day and you were wearing a mask just briefly. And he goes, am I going to have to do that? And you said, no. Nope. Uh, and Jerry's like, that's why I, I love hearing that story. But anyways. I, I was even mad about having more of the mask that day. Yeah, I'm sure. I, when he told that story, I look back on it and I said, there's no way. There's, there's no way. And, because I don't remember that. Um, but I think everybody was trying to do the, the right thing. We you know? didn't know. Yeah. Like in that moment, you know, you just don't know. And, and I had everybody in my ear that like you're doing what mm -hmm. you're you're opening back up you're, yeah you're gonna open now like and i'm like <laughs> yeah what yes yeah, like this is what we do like we're a church you know everybody acted like like we didn't i don't know like we were like starting over and i'm like we're not starting over we're like we're just opening the church we're continuing <laughs> we are the body let's meet you know yeah. and i loved that um which is what what drew me to salt and light um I found a home there quickly, you know, uh, my wife got plugged in, uh, in various areas of the ministry and I was, I hadn't, I hadn't jumped on board yet. Um, I, I was studying my Bible. I was very much into the sermons. I love your teaching style. So this and, was like midway through 2020. Yeah. Midway yeah. 2020. I feel like there's a lot of our origins mm -hmm. of, of first principles yeah. that keep coming back to COVID. Yeah. Like, well, there's so much. There's so many people that, that resonated with salt and light. And then I, I've kind of loved this take on it as well. There's people that need that community and people that want to grow. I've always kind of equated them to the movers and the shakers. Mm -hmm. People that need something. People that, that want to 
I don't know. They, they, they want to do something in the church. And there's a lot of that motivated spirit. And I feel like that was one big thing that just carried salt and light. So mm-hmm. you couple that with people that want to make a difference, want to make a change for the country and the nation. And there you go. You have the yeah. perfect storm. You have all these people in the right spot. So yeah, all of our origin stories kicked off for that. So, mm-hmm. um, but in the nature of not talking all, uh, you know, uh, about my <laughs> history. Church, her church, uh, history, church experience and all that stuff. We, we met, we, we got together, we, um, I found family, and then my wife started volunteering in the youth group. She was singing for a while, and then she her heart has always been kids. I forgot that she sang for a little yeah, while. Yeah, she was on stage for a bit. and um, <laughs> That's good, man. How do I forget that? I don't know. We, uh, I, I, I'm in a conversation with one of my youth group guys the other night, and he gave me the history of the youth group, and I, I loved it. I was like, I don't remember that or that or that, but he's refreshing me on all this stuff but it's good <laughs> so anyway shortly after that she um she started volunteering she goes high school ministry that's where i'm at and uh, and then she and then we had decided to split up the high school and middle school and she's like i'll teach the high school mm-hmm. so she started to do that and um uh, so I was watching her prep lessons and stuff, and you know, whenever you get my wife, you get me. So like, I want to support her and what she's doing. So I started to facilitate. And at this point in my life, you know, teaching young people, you know, wasn't even in my wheelhouse. It wasn't. In, it, it wasn't my heart. And um, I was just like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna go along with it. And um, there's some scripture about this. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here to support. You know. <laughs> And eventually, I, all of the books that I was reading, all of the podcasts I was listening to, all the scripture just kept coming back to, where are the men? Why aren't you standing up? It's time to stand up and lead. And uh, and after a while, I I did. I asked her one night. I said, hey, I, I, really, I don't want to take your thing. I said, but if you would allow me, I'd like to teach one lesson. And, and she started crying. Mm. And she says, Paul, I've been praying for this for years. And... Um, I said, okay. So then I started, I taught my first lesson. Still just a, a volunteer in the youth group. And and I even then, I can't say I loved it. It wasn't love at first sight, but I felt called to it. You know, I felt like I had to do something. And I started doing that. And um, we'll For say, all those people asking themselves, when, yeah. when do you know you're called? Yeah. That's your answer. Yeah. Like you, you just kind of know, like mm-hmm. you don't really have this, you know, audible experience it's more like this kind of growing seed inside of you Mm -hmm. that like you just know although my story is is kind of like a one-off moment i had this really terrible sermon first sermon i ever preached seven minutes and i walked off it was literally seven minutes (laughs) less than a typical intro for a sermon yeah (laughs) and so i I walked off stage and the pastor came back and he was like what was that literally said to me because what was that and i'm not turning around with a stupid grin on my face i'm like I think I'm supposed to be a preacher. And he goes, really? <laughs> so I had like kind of a moment, but I, I kind of knew, you know, going into it as well. So, yeah. so I, it started growing, like seeds starts growing. Yeah. And, you know, I felt this, I felt very similar. I'm sure my first lesson that I put together was, I had no idea what I was doing. I taught topical at first and then I quickly followed your model. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm sure it was along the seven-minute time range. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, I mean, it's easy for teenagers. They don't talk back. You can say whatever you want, and they're just like, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> well, eventually, you know, once they get comfortable with you, they start hitting you with hard questions, and that's when some real growth happens. And, and also, don't forget this. They don't forget what you say. Yeah. Because uh, years later, they're like, you said, and you're like, what? When did I say that? I have had to have many of those conversations, <laughs> and, and I've got some students that are just... They are on fire for the Lord, and man, are they mature, like spiritually mature for their uh, for their age. So it, it challenges me all the time. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, so that began that love for teens began there, and it just it just you know morphed into something crazy. And I love putting it this way: um, I don't, I never would have plotted that course for my life Mm -hmm. and you know if you can go back in my life and find the things that guided me you know in that direction I I don't think you could like I couldn't and I don't think even objectively you could have said I would wind up being a youth pastor Mm -hmm. and um and, and long story short I did that and it was way outside my comfort zone um but the Lord has built me up to to be able to do that and I think do it you know 
I don't know. I'm, I'm no, um, you know, great name in the industry or anything like that. And I don't aspire to be that. I just want to be the guy that helps one, you know, and that's my heart. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I love these uh, teenagers. And, um, so anyway, so being that it was one of the hardest things that I've ever done and outside my comfort zone, um, it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And, uh, to date, mm-hmm. and I'm talking military service. I had almost a dozen years in the military and was, um, you know, had a, a rough separation there, you know, just the whole health thing that the country went through. You know, I was in the reserves, you know, so I did a lot of good things there. You know, I've built uh, businesses with, with partners and we've sold those. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, I've done a lot of things. And of course, you know, my own family, you know, I've raised or am raising three kids right now. Uh, my marriage is, is precious to me. But as far as things that I've done outside of my immediate family, um, you know, leading the youth group and, and interfacing with these teenagers and, and finding their heart and setting a trajectory for their future. Oh, my goodness. I love it. Um, and just for the record, I just want to ask, at, at, where are you right now numerically in the youth group? And I ask that for a reason. I'll, I'll say it in a second. But, like, where are you? Middle school, high school, how many kids are showing up on a Wednesday night or to an event? I mean, we vary, but we're, you know, at a, at a big event or on a good night, we're pushing the 80 mark, 80, 80 plus one night, you know, so. I say that because I know in my heart what's about to happen with first principles. <laughs> and I just wanted to have it marked that the day yeah. that you said there was 80 kids. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. something tells me that number is a growing number. Yeah. And it's, it's. It's grown in phases. You know, we announced first principles and we got excitement in the community and, and we had we had a windfall of students come in, you know, recently and that's just in my ministry. I, I don't have the numbers from the children's ministry um, or or any change from the congregation. I have no idea what any of those things are, but in my small piece it is it has grown, you know. A, a and ton. It, and it's not done. I, I don't mean, think so either. No, I mean the going into the school is is going to make it you when you make a difference in your community when you take care of your community then your community is going to reciprocate yeah and so uh you know that's just part of what's happening right now the children are a huge part of our communities but there are a large number of people believers non-believers that are fed up with what's happening in the public school arena and are looking for alternatives and and i truly believe that well, I, I don't just believe I actually have the numbers to know, like, numerically the school will fill up the moment we open the, the open enrollment. I agree. We'll fill those numbers up. But then even more so, I, I believe that other churches could get involved and I believe probably will get involved and recognize. Just like one of the things I've been saying, I mean, you you know, how, how many youth pastors? Dude, I was a youth pastor for seven years never had 80 you know i think our biggest night we had like 26 one yeah. night you know we had like 26 kids on a wednesday night or something like that and and uh, and that felt huge i mean that's a lot of kids for you know me and my brother to kind of handle uh when we were doing that and so i mean 80 like that's a lot of kids but you know i've been telling people imagine if you could have 500 every day yeah and and poor ministry pour your ministry pour the gospel into them and that's the whole aspect that I keep trying to keep everyone on track for mm-hmm. is, you know, this is a gospel endeavor. This is a missional endeavor. This is not just educational. It is educational. But the whole point of what we want to establish is to restore God into our education. So we'll, we'll, finish, we'll bring ourselves up to speed in regards to, you know, myself, you know, an introduction or whatever. But, but man, what you said there, you know, hey, if you reach 500 a day— so there's this beautiful picture, and I it spoke to my heart as soon as I heard it. And it's this. It's the family, the school, and the church as this 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 tripod, this this I don't want to use the word trinity, you know, but this these three, I kinda like the word trinity. I kinda, I'm kinda <laughs> partial to it, I'm not gonna lie. But um, the these three pillars, you know, that that hold up this idea of the student. Mm-hmm. And if each one of those is doing their job, you're gonna have you know, you're going to have a special person. Yeah. And if each one of those, uh, so just because the church is all about the Lord and all about their education and upbringing and, and moral development and character building, like the church is that. 
the school is a is a missing a leg of that in a lot of people's lives mm -hmm. and by proxy the family if the family isn't tied into the church you don't get god in the family yeah. you know and then there was this removal of god from the schools but the church is a pillar of that and i think the church has done so much good in that but now what if you had that in the school what if you witnessed in the school like one of the times that children are away from their parents and away from their church and a majority a, a of majority the time. and all of the time that they spend in school think of you know think of it as a job an eight to five job like they're away doing other things mm -hmm. if you put the heart of the lord back into that as well that is another big piece yeah and then i don't want to say the family can't help but follow along if they're not already believers but they are the family the parents are much more likely to do that as well and then just let's say let's use the idea of the christian family you know a, a god-centered bible education centered school and a church you have all of those things that is the recipe for success I, yeah i believe that that is why we will see the community turned on its head mm -hmm. in a good way yeah um, that if I was to say it and you know maybe are kind of more modern I, I love the term of like turning the world upside down right? right like Paul goes into Thessalonica and they're like these are the guys that turn the world upside down and I love even more I had never seen it till we started first principles uh, I had never paid attention that when Paul went in to Thessalonica that he had the, the city he had come from um, that he just as always he went into the synagogues the synagogues rejected mm -hmm. him yeah, so Acts chapter eight, 18, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Acts chapter 18. And anyways, the city said, he goes in the synagogue, synagogues reject him. And so he went into the school of Tyrannius. Yeah. And he taught from the school of Tyrannius. And then what we read in, in the next verse is that all of Asia Minor heard. Yeah. All of Asia Minor had heard about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that numerically, we talk about this when we talk about missions and evangelism. If you look at that numerically, that was probably to the tune of about 8 million people. And it certainly, you know, that's not a, a statistical number to say every single person in Asia Minor had heard. But obviously, the masses had heard. Yeah. 8 million people had heard about Jesus. And where was Paul teaching from? In the school? From the school. So and cool. so I, I just love that, I, that aspect of... You know, if you think about like what you're saying, this kind of tripod, and you imagine it, if you had a stool that had three legs on it, you take two of the legs off of it, can you kind of lean on it? I mean, maybe a little bit, but you're certainly not resting on it. Right. But but you, you put those other two legs back in place, and now you can you can rest on that. You know, yeah. you have a support system. And I think that that's the part. I, I agree with you that I think the family will, I think the family will feel more empowered to follow suit. Where right now there's this church and school that are separated mm -hmm. because we have religion not that we see it as a religion but you know we see this as faith and relationship but but i'm just saying from a worldly perspective there's religion on one leg and then there's school which is education and education can't blend into religion and unless we're having a religion class where we talk about all religions or something of that nature but to have the school now empowering the family to say our church is, we're teaching faith. Our school is teaching faith. Yeah. Then it's only going to follow suit that home is going to feel more empowered to do that yeah. and not so not so pulled apart. Like yeah. these two things are separate. And I think there's so much um, evidence of that. There's so much um, truth to, okay, you know, you, you get a, a child into ministry at some point. I hear, or I've heard my entire life, story after story of people... Um, families that have been saved because the child oh um because the child started coming you know what i could tell them to you exactly you know whether it was vbs or something like that mm -hmm. like there are like that is so key because what do parents want they want the best for their child yeah and they're like well maybe i'm not living the best life that i can but let me get my child involved yeah and then what does that become they start hearing the good things that their child has and and then their child's excited about it and the mom and dad want to be involved and it just it follows to reason you know so i i, I love that even those who are not part of the church and don't see the importance of the church in their own life recognize the importance of going to church I, weekly i meet with new people and i I just want to know why they came. You know, they come to church and I say, well, what brought you here? Where were you before? Were you at a church before? And if they're not, if they haven't been at a church, there's always this like regret moment. They're like, you know, 
I, I haven't been. I know I need to go more. You know, I know it's like we know that it's needed. We know, like innately, we know that it's good. And so when your student starts to go, when when the child begins to go, and and also another part of that too is when a child convicts you. You know, when when the child throws out the moral thing mm-hmm. that you were doing immorally yeah. you know oh, sometimes yeah. they don't even know it you know sometimes a child is just saying oh we learned this or we learned that and then there's that convicting moment oh yeah and so to bring that character that christian character that biblical character um, back into our children is going to bleed into the home yeah and so i completely agree and you, you spoke earlier you know the, the innocence of a child you know uh, they'll say anything <laughs> so when, when you hear in Sunday school, you know, we're convicting on, you know, sin and what sin is and what that might look like, a child's just going to spout it out. And a parent, I'm telling you, there have been things that my kids have said. And yep. It's just, oh, all right then, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, I love I always that. like to go with, you're right, let's do, you're let's, right, let's do that. Okay, let, let me process. I'm not ready to own up to this in front of you but there will be some change because now you recognize you know right. something like that because you're getting old enough to recognize yeah that. oh man yeah i remember uh taking my kids one time to the movies and we were going to sneak in snacks <laughs> and you know like that's what you do right you go to the movies i don't have 200 dollars for the snacks and, yeah and you know one of my kids says to me like yeah but I mean, technically, isn't this the isn't this their business like isn't this how they make their money and like i'm like a small business owner and i'm like <laughs> just deflate a little bit <laughs> you know i'm so proud of us like we're yeah. stuffing stuff in mom's yeah. bag and you yeah. know we're like it's all like this big fun. and just to be clear i totally still sneak stuff into the movies okay. but yeah uh, I, I know mean, <laughs> i'm not you know if they're I charging have, five dollars for a little thing at m M&M. yeah yeah that's called robbery <laughs> yeah you know, maybe but like anyways <laughs> uh but yeah i've definitely been convicted in similar ways and uh, it, it always hurts but it's always a little room for growth, too. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> so, but I mean, in that moment, I just remember that conviction of like, no. oh, shoot. <laughs> the kids want to do right now, but we're like sneaking stuff in. And, yeah. Uh, I think even worse is I probably was like, shut up, stick it yeah. in your pocket. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm t- this character development. <laughs> yeah, we, we gotta we gotta learn how to sneak into stuff. I'll uh, show you how to jump from one theater to the next. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know those good life skills that they need. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Somebody's gonna watch this. Like he's a bastard. Yeah. Uh, he just said he went movie hopping. Yeah. That was the thing, man. You would you would wait for the movie to end. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you'd like look for the ones that are gonna be close to when oh, yours yeah. is ending. And yeah, absolutely. Th- those were my college days. And what was bad? It was at you know uh, when I was going to school. It was the Danbury Dollar. So oh. it was already like a dollar Tuesdays <laughs> or whatever. So it was, a, and then I movie hopped in a dollar, <laughs> in a dollar theater. Yeah, I was like, man, I'm getting my money's worth out of this. Oh goodness. Yeah, but that's before they had all the arranged seating. Oh yeah, everybody gets to pick their seat now. You know, I, I'm I like it. It's it's great. Um, but there's still been times where I get in there and there's empty seats to my right or to my left and like ah, maybe a little bit more you know over this way or that way you know like the theater's totally going to be empty nobody's going to be there and then someone comes up and there's that awkward conversation of, oh i'm sorry let me and the chairs are like seat. twice as wide now yeah i mean before they were like stadium seating <laughs> yeah i found the heated seats the other day i didn't realize that was a thing oh yeah so yeah reclining good that's old hat you know that's been around for a while but if you double tap that button it turns red and i thought i was gonna you know set something on fire and it turns out i did but it was all this I was like, oh, it's warm. Wait, you double tap the button and they heat up? Yeah, you, you, it's like you have the up and the down arrow, and then the center, you push the whole button in, I think. Maybe that's what it is. And then it turns like a dull red because I was getting worried. Like, I did it and didn't notice, and my back started to get warm. And I did not know this was coming from this podcast today, but I... I mean, am. knowledge. You must have it. You know? <laughs> I'm here to tell you, local theaters have seat heaters in them. Do so, any of them have air conditioners? In oh, them? That would be that. I don't know. That that's probably still in the hand. Can of we the like break the fourth wall and tell them like, hey, yeah, please go do that. Yeah. <laughs> Put in the AC in the seats. Yeah. It's, All right. So fun. so tell me, how did we get from your perspective? Uh-huh. How did we get from youth ministry to to not just jumping in with the school, but even at this point taking on a, the head of school position. And w- we should have probably, by way of introduction, introduced that, you know, yeah. b- uh, that you are uh, our school minister. Mm-hmm. And so that, for us, 
is, you know, what you would think of as a principal or superintendent or head of school or um, yeah. what are they? What, what's the other word? There's something master, school master, headmaster, headmaster. That yep, headmaster. Yeah, headmaster is. In, I've heard that that sounds stuffy and old fashioned. I think it does. I didn't like it the first time I heard it. So. I don't know. I resonated with it. I was like. You know, and then I had <laughs> like, I, I was a little bit of a little bit of self conviction. I'm like, I only serve one master. Uh, okay, I get it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, all of those things. Um, we're, we're calling school minister. School minister. You will, that is you will head the school. Yes. Um, from a kind of a principal position. Mm-hmm. How in the world did you go from um, entrepreneur? Um, you know, kind of going after that life, moved into, as we heard, moved into youth ministry. Now, how did we go from youth ministry to now I'm going to dedicate a large chunk of my life <laughs> to the education of, of students? And the goal is K through 12. Yeah. So that's moving off of the high school and now taking on elementary as well, yeah, in a children's ministry as well. So, how did we get to that? Well, that's a great question, and I'd like to say it all started with some brisket. So, <laughs> okay, not not true. I, I had heard stories about the school, and I'd even been introduced to people that have done the legwork for years, um, getting this up and going. I had conversations with you about it, mm-hmm. and there was always like, "There's this group at our church, and they want to start this endeavor." And then it became really big with the church and on your radar and you announced it to us and you're like, this is happening. And so let me step back one one um, subject here and say from the youth group and that heart that had developed for this trajectory approach, like pick a point on the horizon, talking to my students and sail towards that, um, like help shaping them and help, help directing them to what that looks like. And it could be their career, it could be their you know, their their hobby, their music. You know, I've got people that want to weld in the youth group. I've got people that are swimmers. And, you know, I encourage them in all those things. But I always, like my job, of course, as the youth uh, leader is to point them back to Christ. So all of those facets and all of those relationships have built me up to have a heart and to love them and to want the best for them. It's like they're my kids, you know. And, and, and I love that personal connection, personal relationship. So that heart for students and then just a general love for, and this took me a long time to admit out loud, but a general love for education personally. Um, <laughs> I I was one of those, I hated school, school was challenging, school was hard. That was, that's a lie, school was easy for me, but there's there's a different, that's a whole other segue. S- school was hard because somebody was making you do it. Somebody made me sit there and do all these things. Anyways, um, I, okay, so, so I built the heart for young people in the youth ministry. And then you know, we started to have these steering committee meetings and I was just an outside guy. You know, I mean, I, I knew I was involved in some facets. I was a deacon at the church and, you know, um, you know, this is an endeavor of the church, you know? So I was like, okay, I'm going to be behind the scenes. I'll be involved. I want to make it work. There'll be shared space. I'm the youth leader. I'm sure they're going to want to use my classrooms, you know? So all of it was just like, I'm going to be involved, you know, kind of, from the background and, that, and that's mm-hmm. where my mind was yeah i showed up to the first meeting not having any idea what i was walking into and there was so much activity and so much heart for the education side i mean it's contagious you know i couldn't be around people that wanted it so much and not catch some of that fire mm-hmm. so i went to the first meeting i may have gone it may have been the second meeting but at one of those meetings Someone asked, you know, would you consider doing this? And it was a side conversation. It wasn't even part of the main discussion. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit and, you know, I probably grabbed some snacks because I'm motivated by food. And I came back, sat down, and then there was like this hot seat moment. Um, you had just left that meeting. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting by the fireplace and there's, you know, a couch and a bunch of people there. And someone said, well, I think... What, what do you guys think about Paul? And nobody really knows me. I mean, they, they all know me from church and they know me from being on the stage and doing deacon things and taking care of their kids. And, you know, the, I mean, people know me, you know, in the background, so to speak. And so when it was brought up, it was like, hey, what do you think about this guy? You know, and I'm sitting right there and everybody kind of turns to me and say, what do you, like, why would you make a good head of school or head minister? And my initial response was, 
I wouldn't. You know, like there, there, there has to be someone else. But I just found myself, and I think this was the Lord, because I wouldn't have done this to myself on purpose, but I just, I started talking about my students, and I started talking about my love for them, and I started talking about building a child in the way they should go. You know, I know that's parents, but still, like, the idea is we're pouring into them, and we want to give them this opportunity. And I homeschool my kids, so I believe in the best education that I can give them, and all my kids are young right now, so it's it's easy. I, I don't know what older ages homeschool looks like but uh yeah you got a, you got an idea you got an idea what that looks like an idea okay well I who I was talking, I, maybe it was you the other day i'm like you do realize right. i've graduated too i'm on i'm on my way to graduating my third so. yeah um yeah well the, i'm just the, an 80 year old living in a 37 year old's body yeah well you <laughs> there's there's so much knowledge and experience in the homeschool crowd like i've uh, you know, in our church, so many have graduated. You know, um, of course, the Allers, the, the house that we were in, they've graduated a few as well. So, um, what, like 19? I don't know, like 19, <laughs> you know, like at it. least, you know, and about ready to graduate their last, I think. So, in any case, um, so there's the love for education there, you know, um, and I just began to speak and I, I began to, I, I let my heart for the, for the students show. And uh, I guess that planted a seed with somebody, and I wasn't intending to apply, you know that that. But but I couldn't, I couldn't stay on the sidelines after that. Um, at that point, something had started, and uh, I'm a I'm a self starter. I love starting new things. I have that entrepreneurial background. I've started many things, um, and it was a new and exciting thing, you know. And, but education wasn't a realm that I wanted to step into um, until the Lord said, put a fire in me to say that you want to step into this. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I was like, yes, Lord, I got it. I'm in. And then once there was still a struggle because I like I'm a discerning person. I realized how much work this was going to be. And that didn't deter me. Mm-hmm. And then I took all of these things, all of these thoughts that I was having um, to the person on this planet that I respect the most and that's my wife and I began to talk to her about it and she was off put by the idea you know and and as as I am motivated and excited and driven to do new things she is reserved and cautious and thoughtful and very wise (laughs) so you put the two of us together sometimes like we make better decisions together I'll just say that (laughs) So after a while, we talked about it, and I kept coming back to it. And finally, she said, okay, we sat down one day and decided we can do this. Like, it's going to be a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. And um, she eventually, like, we talked ourselves through it, and we decided not only can I, but I want. And it's not because of something that I, I want. There's nothing you know, physical that I want out of this, I want to support and to grow and to build these students. Mm -hmm. And she saw that heart in me. And once we determined that this isn't a a fleeting passion, you know, this isn't something that's going to go away. This is something the Lord is building me into. Like my, my background doesn't say education, but but I love education. I've got a, you know, I've got a degree in nuclear engineering. Like who, does that help with education? No, but I took a lot of schooling to get that. You know, I've, 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 I'm close to other degrees. I was looking to go into Bible um, college for or seminary for um, you know to to further round out myself as a youth minister. Like I, again, education in my older years uh, has really grown, or my love of education has grown, kind of all unbeknownst to me. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, all of that said, that's kind of the transition from youth minister. Or youth leader to um, to head minister or head of school. I mean, I it, it wasn't a direct road. There wasn't, hey, I'm I'm now doing this for the church, and I suddenly want all of this responsibility. Yeah, uh, that surely wasn't it. Um, <laughs> I think I could speak to my human nature and say, ah, oh, this is the easy road. I want to take the easy road. Well, I would dare to say that of all the endeavors that we have jumped into in church. Uh, this is one of the bigger ones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
biggest yeah <laughs> biggest it's, one it's it is big and it to me it's it's even more of an indicator of how the lord is in it yeah you know because uh being on the inside um seeing the various um things that have come up already the blessings and the testimony i mean to me it's easy yeah. i see those things it, but it's hard to even articulate it for someone else i have that that hasn't seen all of them like the Lord is moving in such mm. a powerful way, and uh, I don't know. You know what? And that, what you just said about like the Lord moving in a powerful way, I think that that's attractive. Like that's something that attracts me. Yeah. You know, when I see the Lord moving, I, I just think back to like, you know, last year, maybe a little over a year ago, you had the Asbury revival. Yeah. And I just wanted to go to the Asbury revival, and and you know, somebody be like, why? Like why? What's happening there? Like our our and I'm like, well, I mean, like, Spirit of the Lord, so they've been worshiping for like, you know, 10 days or whatever it's been, you know, it's been like nonstop worship. And, and, uh, and they were like, yeah, but I mean, is there this and is there that? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, the end result of that was like, I, I, I just remember saying, telling them, I'm like, if the Lord's there, I want to be there. I love that. So we have um, missionaries that we support in Honduras, uh, yeah. Greg and Gene Hines, yeah. right? So they were in, and it was about, I think it was Thanksgiving time frame, I can't remember. Um, and Greg was like a celebrity. He was always surrounded by people and, um, he made his way over and I'm kind of personable, you know, a little bit. And I was like, Hey, how's it going? You know, good, good. And we just got to talking and he laid, uh, an author out there. He's like, Oh, you floated this idea. And it, you know, I was still in thoughts then, you know, this wasn't school thoughts. This was just youth minister thoughts. And I was like, I don't know, you know, what the Lord has for me. You know, I just want to be there to serve all of these things. And he hit me with something that is just stuck. It just found its root in my soul. And he said, you know, how do you know? I think the conversation was this. I said, how do I, because I've got a lot of young men, how do I not get them out of their parents' basement, but how do I help them find their calling? How do I help them find what it is? Because I've got young men that are, that say, I want to, I want to serve the Lord, but I'm waiting on the Lord. Mm -hmm. I like, guess great. You can wait, but you can't be stagnant. You yeah. can't pause in life. And I think that's what led us to this conversation. And Greg says, Paul, he goes, I read in a book once, you just look, you, you just see where the Lord is moving or like in regards to Asbury, where the Lord is mm -hmm. and go there. So see where the Lord is moving and where the spirit is moving and be there. Yeah. I mean, you can't say that the Lord isn't moving in this school, but like he is, he is the driving force of this. And I just want to be there. Yeah. You know, and I, I've read one time that, um, if you watch surfers, mm -hmm. surfers out on the ocean, they don't, they don't sit, sit on their board and try to create waves. Yeah. They look for where the waves are. They study the, they study the, the horizon, so to speak. And then they go sit on their board and they wait for the Lord to create a wave. Yeah. And that's what they surf. Yeah. And that's what we're doing in God is mm -hmm. to like look for the waves that he's creating. Yes. And then we surf it for as long as he's, as long as he's got it up, you know, yeah. then, then that's what we're surfing. That's what we're doing. I thought that was a really great illustration. I'm trying to think of who's, who said that. But it doesn't matter. Um, but it just I just thought it was a great illustration to, to kind of point out, like, we're not creating the thing. Mm -hmm. We're riding the thing. I mean, I know for maybe some people's perspective is like, but you are kind of creating it. Like, we're starting a school. I can promise you. Yeah. I did not want to start a school. You did not want <laughs> yeah. that. Nobody wanted that to start with. Now, I mean, it's certainly there now. Yeah. I think for me, the passion came from the, the great need. Yes. You know, the great need. The more that I begin to put two puzzle pieces together that, I, you know, I've allowed myself to be a part of that crowd that had separated, you know, those two puzzle pieces being that we have our students, everybody saying what's happening with our generations, what's happening with our generations. Why isn't the church doing something? Why isn't the church doing something? And, and trying to like wrestle with that. Like what, like what more can we do? What's kind of in my head? Like what more can we do? Like we put ourselves out there, we invite our kids, we, we train them up as best we can. And, and then it was like really, then, you know, the other side of it was like all these things happening in the school and not that today's podcast is about my own story, but I mean, you kind of remember that for me, some of that started with the library. Yeah. I had taken my daughter to the library oh, yeah. to go get a book. She, my daughter comes to me and says, dad, I want to read. This was last summer. Yeah. She, this beginning of last summer. She says, I want to read over the summer. Like, I mean, a homeschool dad's dream. Yes. Like, and I, I'm a solo <laughs> parent. So I'm like, you know, I'm like, yeah, my daughter wants to read. I'm yeah. doing something 
right. Go ahead and get pat yourself on the back for that. Right. I mean, there's like, well, I'm like, I got one thing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to take her to the library and we're going to go get a book. And, you know, m- my wife had always had the library cards and whatever. And so I just, I'm like, I don't know how to do the library. Like, I haven't been to the library since I was seven, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that's not true. I <laughs> was like, that was hyperbole. But <laughs> okay. Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm judging a little bit in my mind. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it had been a while. It had right? been a minute, okay. And so I'm like, all right, I got to go get her a library card. You know, I'm sure the one we had was expired. And so we go up there, and they give us library cards. And we go around, and they're like, how old are you? And they recommend this section. And, and, of course, it was this time of year, which we're going into June, which is Pride Month. So I'm sure that had, you know, plenty to do with yeah. it. But, you know, I rounded the corner, and, and there's all these books, these Pride books. and But then even more so, you know, we're trying, I, I, you know, telling them, uh, that we're looking for, you know, she's 11 years old and we're looking for some, you know, fictional books that she could read over the summer. And, and they're like, oh, we've got some stuff for you. And, and they're pulling stuff off the shelves and handing them to my daughter. And they're like about two boys, two teenage boys trying to be in a relationship. And uh, anyways, I was so, I'm not trying to go too long on that, but I just, I was so devastated by that. I, I took a picture of it and I posted on my personal Facebook page about that, those books but that was a starting point for me of like, what is going on mm-hmm. that you're in front of her dad, you're pulling these, you know. How is this okay? Yeah, how is this like, okay? Like you're pulling off sexually driven books, homosexual sexually driven books and handing them to my 11 year old daughter. And and I was, I, I remember looking at Phoebe and I was like, Phoebe, give me that book. Like in front of me, I was like, give me that book. And I turned up and I start like reading because the cover is like, like a drawn picture of like two boys look like they're getting ready to kiss. And then like, and I flip it up, I'm reading this inside cover and I'm like, I just looked at the lady and was like, we're going to pass on that. Yeah. And, and I was just so devastated that, that they would do that with our children. And, and I'm here, I am like sheltered homeschool parent, but that was a big defining moment for me. And then putting those puzzle pieces together to say, wait a second, is the church really doing everything we can? Yeah. Or is there an element that we're missing where we could be involved? And then, of course, that's led me into this whole thought of who else could? Yeah. What other infrastructure in America is built for this? Could do something of this size? I mean, we're talking a, a gigantic size and honestly speaking if if every church in america would get on board and say we want to bring god back into education we're going to do that by opening up a a free school for students to come to so that we can put god back in their education and really change the community the truth is there's still too many students yeah like there's still not enough but but yet i would say that for me this goes into the where christ said that the gates of hell cannot prevail yeah like that's the whole thing like Sure, there's a, a gigantic task in front of us, but who else could do this? Well, I would say none other than those in the army of the Lord could make such an endeavor happen. Absolutely. And so that's that's where you know I've been coming from. So I'm curious to get into as well. I know we've been going for a few minutes, but I, I would love to hear a little bit about your passion, what I've seen from you, your passion for the principal approach and what we're doing educationally, you know, I've seen you kind of leaping into that head first. And so I don't know wherever you want to start with that, but I know that you've done like the peers tests and you've, you know, been going really, really headlong into the, into the, the principal approach method, mm-hmm. which is kind of our methodology of teaching. And so just, I would love to hear like your kind of love growing love for that. And you know, where that's where you see that headed at least. Yeah. Um, so I, I love, well, I just, first off, I'll go back. I love that story that you just started. That was the start of the wave, whether you realized it or not. Going mm. to that library, like, yeah. your board got picked up, and you're headed, you're, you're along for the ride. So, and here I am surfing this. And here school. I am surfing this right now. So we're, we're good. <laughs> I've always said I wanted to surf. <laughs> yeah, and there you go. So. It's just, it's a, it's a, a figurative at this point. Yeah. Don't worry, you'll get there. Um, but as far as the educational style that we picked up, yeah, uh, so I... I love learning, and I love learning new things. And um, one of the key pieces of the of the principal approach, or one of the things that most inspires me, I should say, is a look back at my own education. I'm a product of a Becca. I went to a Christian school. I um, I, I don't know. I, I thought it was good. You know, had a lot of Bible verses in it. You know, it, you know, my parents did the best they could, and they had me in school, so I have that perspective. Um, <clears throat> and yet. All of my uh, younger education, 
I look back on it and it was incredibly easy for me from a testing perspective. Um, you know, even even in the book reporting, like all of it, it, it was very easy for me. And I, I kind of draw a line to, and, and this is, you know, my short-term memory is pretty good. So when I think of terms, think in terms of multiple choice and true false and all of those things, you know, that made it easy for me. And, and education isn't supposed to be easy. Like it's, it's, you know, we do hard things to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at any point in history, of, you know, we'll, put, we'll say a nation, you know, any nation that has had peace forever, think Switzerland or something like that, what good did they contribute to the world over the years? Um, they made a cuckoo clock once, you know? So I don't know. It, it takes struggle. It's a cuckoo clock. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a nice thing. I mean, it really is. You know? um, <clears throat> I don't own one, let's put it that way. But anyways. They made the army knife. Oh, that they, they did. They took the blade out of the Swiss army knife. Like, that's a new push. It, it, it bothers. There's no more blade in the Swiss army knife. It's a multi-tool, but it's not a... It's still red. Okay, sorry. I just I'm I like knives. You know, it's I'm bothered by this. I am too. This it's is like two things, Army. man. The okay. heated seat and now the Swiss Army knife. I, I'm glad you're here for this. This is a wealth. Yeah, a wealth, wealth of information. information today. So the ease of education. Let me get back on yeah, task. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. ease of education. Uh, you know, we do hard things to grow. Okay, that was where I went with that. You know, nations that have tr struggled with hard things, they have grown the most. Think America, world wars. You know, different things like that. Okay. Students, I don't want to think of it in terms of combat, but you do hard things to grow. And to me, multiple choice, true, false, that was never a hard thing for me. Yeah. And I would say I didn't grow as much as I could have in those cases. Mm -hmm. And the final piece of that is there is no record of my education back then. Now, my mother, I was, a, I was an only child, and she saved everything. I won't even go into the laundry list of the things that she still has, but let's just say she broke out all of my old GI Joes the other day for my son and they're all still there. And she's like, do you remember the name of this one? And I, so anyways, and you she, probably did. I, I did. I, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Storm Shadow is my favorite. Anyways, um, she, so, so she saved all of my books, all my notebooks, all of, all of those things. And even in there at best, it was, I would go back in the book and copy the bold text. They gave me the bold text. Like this is an important mm -hmm. thing to remember. Mm -hmm. So they highlighted that for me and I went back and found it and then wrote it over here. Mm -hmm. I did not, there's no way to prove that I had an understanding of what that was. Yeah. So for the principal, principal approach, one of the main things that excites me is this idea of the notebook method or the notebook approach. Mm -hmm. And that is you have a lifelong roadmap of this is what you learned and whether it's right or wrong, this is how you understood it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much absence of the parent in the classroom nowadays. So many parents that I've talked to and, and interviewed over the past month or so um, have said, you know, hey, in my educational institution, whatever it is, I am removed from that. I have no idea when their tests are. I don't know what they're learning. It's just this gap and our our children are our most precious resource and we're sending them out with a blank check mm -hmm. or as a blank slate and we have no idea what's being written on them. Wow. So now back to the notebook approach, you have this, this, you have a physical copy and you can go to it and you can read their learning last week. They learned this thing about history and this is what they got out of it mm -hmm. or this is what they understood about it. And that is a, that is something that you can carry your life over. Mm -hmm. How, how beneficial would it be to see the progression of your education as an adult? I would love to have that now. I would love to go back and, and wrap my mind around what was important to a young Paul Thomas, you know, about the Civil War, you know, what I grabbed then. Now, having been in the military, my perception has changed. But I, what did the, you know, the clean slate mind of young Paul Thomas think about these these topics like that is that is very interesting to me and we have precedence for this you know the the founding fathers of our country we still have literal notebooks that George Washington has filled out like they're in I don't I think the Library of Congress I don't know exactly where they're stored but we have them in digital version as well and you can see what he wrote mm -hmm. um, as it's been a while it's a couple yeah. hundred years you know what I'm yeah. saying so that is one thing that resonates with me. I'm a journaler as well. I like to journal. I like to, um, you know, jot down my thoughts. Um, 
I, I carry around my brain with me, you know, because uh, there's just not enough uh, gray matter in there to retain all the things that I need. So, so I, I'm constantly taking notes, uh, and that just, you know, of course, it just ticked with me anyway. You know, I, I love writing, and um, you know, they, they say the, uh, the the best way to remember or retain something is um, uh, read it, write it, say it. I believe, mm -hmm. you know, or, or whatever order that's supposed to go in. Um, but those three things uh, are what you what you do to to really lock it in, really lock that information in. Yeah. And um, you know, it's it, if you think about it, it's also things that interest you. So we'll go back to my GI Joe analogy. I still remember the name of that GI Joe. Is that useful at all? No, but it was. It was built into me as a young man. At, you know, when when your mind is fresh, those are the formative years. Yep. I still remember the name of a GI Joe. Like, yep. not important, not useful in life. But you, children, myself, all of us, we're so moldable at that age. Mm -hmm. Why not use our? Why not use the church? Yeah. You know, with this biblically based school and eventually hope to grow that into a Christ-centered family at a young age. Mm -hmm. What kind of people could we make? Yeah. What kind of people could God make through us? Like there's there's so much development and there's so much potential for the kingdom. Yeah. You talked earlier about the army. Well, we're training our soldiers. That's right. Are you, what are, are you gonna get more out of their training when they're in their 30s? Or are you going to get more when you when you mold a mind and you shape it and you you begin to chisel it and you have this masterpiece, you know, of a foundation that is just that is unmatched. I I love that. That's my heart. I used to teach guitar and I would have parents come and they would say, "Is my student too young? He's five. He's six. She's you know." seven or five or whatever you know can they learn and i would tell them i would say you have to understand there's, there's two parts of this right like the one part of this says they can only physically do so much right we can only expect the dexterity of their fingers to get us so far yeah and so as long as you can accept that today they're going to be playing twinkle twinkle little star on one string mm -hmm. right one little finger twinkle twinkle but if they will pick up that guitar today and, and begin to fall in love with that guitar today, this is what I would share with them, then what you have is that's by the time they're 11, 12, 13, and their dexterity has picked up, that they have an understanding of music and they have an understanding of the guitar, the method of the guitar, mm -hmm. that now you have that 12-year-old that is blowing people away. Yeah. And 12 will be here before you know it. And you have this 12 year old that's going to blow everybody away and they're going to go, how, how do they do that? And so I had this student come, she was eight years old when she came to take guitar for me. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, I said to her, I was like, have you, do you know anything about the guitar? She said, I can play, take me out to the ball game. And so she's one string, one pick, one finger, and she's ping, 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 ping. She plays take me out to the ball game. Yeah. And I'm like, that's great. And so I told her mom that same thing. I'm like, look, she's eight years old. There's only so much we can expect from her fingers. You know, she's not playing Mozart tomorrow. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but if you'll, if she'll stick with it. Anyways, my point being, by the time that girl was 16 years old, she was going, she literally went from my basement where we sit <laughs> from here. She was going to international guitar competitions and winning and uh, playing, you know, full on classical style guitar, finger picking style guitar. And, um, you know, everybody would, uh, st my other students that would come around her before and after, they would hang out, but they'd come early because yeah. they wanted to see her practice. They wanted to see her play. Oh, and awesome. she, she was just playing. She was, it was beautiful the way she could play. She was getting hired, 16 years old, she was getting hired at weddings. And everybody was like, how, how does she do it? And, and I would tell them, I'm like, she's been playing since she was eight. Mm -hmm. You know, she, it was ingrained in her to do that. And so I, I think that's what you're describing is you have these children that are moldable why are we not mold what dude i love what you just said about like the this here's we've given everybody a blank check you know yeah. there's this gap and we've given a blank check and that is our children like they're moldable you know what we write on them is important yeah and so to put education to put a value back in education to say and not just a value in education i think everybody has a value in n nobody wants to be a dummy Right. Nobody wants to be illiterate. Exactly. Everybody has a value in education. Mm -hmm. To put a value on putting God back in that education yes. 
And that is the element that I have been contending this whole time Mm -hmm. is missing from our public education is God has been removed. And when you remove God, you remove hope. And now we see the devastating effects of that. I mean, we're still, I had posted a reel a few months ago, maybe a month ago, right before the, the, um, vision tour yeah. that we did. I'd posted a reel and I'd made the comment that between the ages of 12 and 14, the second leading cause of death is suicide. The number of people that are underneath of that commenting in our state, suicide is the leading cause of teen death. Yeah. The leading cause of teen death. I, and I contend, I go, what is happening? Like, I know it's not a question of like what is happening in the sense that it's rhetorical. Like what, you know, what is happening in our community? And it is that we have removed the one who brings hope. Yeah. We certainly, if you go back a hundred years ago, we did not have teen suicide as the leading cause of teen death. No. It was not there. And so something has happened. We've lost something. And I think us as believers know what that is. Now the question is, will we do something about it? Yeah. That's been a big thing that I've seen is the challenging effect that we've put on others yeah. to say, well, wait a second. Like if, if, if salt and light is correct, if first principles is correct, then now we have to do something. Oh, yeah. And that's a challenging. It's convicting. Yeah. It's, it's a hard pill to swallow. And I, I've used this analogy recently in the youth group uh, for, for various um you know, lesson points, but I think it's really relevant here. If I'm walking through life and I see my friend, my neighbor, if I see a stranger walking towards the edge of a cliff, we'll call it eternity, call it death, uh, because, uh, you know, this, this lack of education, we're talking about death, teen suicide, Mm -hmm. right? So if they don't have a biblical foundation, if they don't have hope, they're walking towards death Mm -hmm. and they're just challenged with it much younger than they should be. Not that anyone should ever have to go through that, but it's become a reality. It's become an option in their Mm -hmm. minds. So the analogy goes like this. If you see someone walking towards a cliff, there's no human that won't try to stop them. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, you, there's something in all of us that says, I must save them. They can't see where they're going. I'm outside of their circumstances. Let me grab them. And now in terms of, of salvation, what do you do? You impose you in their life. You, you pray over them. You do what you can. And if they reject and continue to walk, your recourse is to stand back and to pray for them. Yeah. Well, with the same analogy, if our students are walking towards this uncertain future, yeah. again, I, to, it's harsh, but call it death. If they're walking towards this uncertain future of which the statistics support, why wouldn't we do everything that we can yeah. to reach out to them and grab them and give them that lifeline and right. give them that hope? Yeah. I mean, we would. You yeah. would. Anybody would do that. If you make it real in your mind, you can't sit on the sidelines. And to not put too fine a point on it, that's why I'm here. Mm-hmm. I still struggle with the uh, imposter mentality. I know I've talked to you about it. <laughs> I, uh, but but I'm all in. I've made the decision. I've I've committed in my mind. I'm gonna do something. And now that I've come to terms with it, I've really started to enjoy it. Yeah. I don't tell everybody this, but I love the meetings. I love the planning. <laughs> I love the growing. Like. The meetings could be a little shorter. The meetings could be a little shorter, but, you know. I'm sorry, yeah, ladies. Uh, I love y'all. Yeah, good. But, uh, uh, it, you know. I, Anytime I mean, we schedule a meeting, I know we've got three hours. It's good. Yeah, again, even, even that. Like, I've found a love for it, and I think the Lord has planted that in me because, you know, in a past professional uh, role, you know, I hated, I would say, I hate to meet to meet, you know, or to meet to make other meetings or whatever, but it's it's not work anymore, yeah. you know, because I've flipped the script in my mind. I see students and I see the cliff mm. and I'm like, there's, you know, there's the cliff and here is the better way. Your analogy has reminded me of a scenario that I had um, a couple of years ago. I went to South Carolina and, um, you know, you always hear of gators in Florida. Mm-hmm. South Carolina is riddled with some gators. I was stationed there for a couple so of the, years. So then you know. Yeah. So we're in this little place. It was called uh, Seabrook. Seabrook Island. Yep. And uh, we were at, we were at Seabrook Island. And we're, there's, it's like a little island community. So there's really just kind of one hub of you know restaurants and stuff. And there's an outdoor bench. And we're probably, I don't know, 
50 yards from some water and yeah. there isn't a gator sitting at the edge of the water. We're 50 yards away. So I feel safe enough that I'm like, we can chill out here and eat our ice. We're literally eating ice cream on this bench, watching, seeing this gator. And this guy is power walking mm-hmm. and he is headed right for that gator. He's like walking along the edge of the water and he is just like marching fast. And, uh, and I'm like, Oh, he's like, he's there and the gator's there and he's getting closer and closer and closer. And I'm like, he doesn't see that gator. <laughs> and it's a true story. My kids were there with me. Well, so I'm like, I'm like, somebody's got to do something. So I jump up and I'm like, hey, hey. And I'm like waving my arms. And he, he's got earbuds and he's not hearing us. Dude, the whole crowd, like all of these people, we all start like everybody's rushing him. We're all like, hey, hey. Like we're running towards this guy. And he gets maybe from like me to, I don't know, that door, like 20 feet, not even 20 feet from this gator. And we are starting to run at this guy. And now he's looking at us and he's definitely not looking at the gator. And so finally he gets so close and the gator like jumped up and jumped in the water, thankfully. Yeah. Anyways, I remember sitting down and and Jennifer, my daughter, she looked at me and she said, what would you have done if that gator had grabbed that guy? Like you you can't wrestle an alligator. And I I said to her, I was like, I would have. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) She said, you can't wrestle an alligator. And this is what I told her. I was like, I would have tried. Yeah. Like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit down and eat my ice cream while some guy's getting attacked by a yeah you, by a gator. I'm gonna try. That's that sideline mentality. You're not gonna do that. It's not in us to, right. to just wait. Uh, and and like I'm thinking about that crowd of people. I mean, I know like I'm describing probably not doing a great job describing. It. I mean, it was a large group of people that is like we're we're gonna we're all trying to save him. We're all like, hey, like you're you're walking for this danger. And I think that that's what we were missing when it comes to our students and their education is. I don't know if it's maybe people aren't seeing the cliff or we don't want to see the cliff or whatever it is. But I think like for you and I and those who are involved with with what we're doing, we're seeing the cliff. And so for everybody else, we're seeing the gator, if you will. Like, so for everybody else who's like, like, why are you all on this? That's why, like, we're part of that group that's now running towards them and saying, hey, 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 like, don't, don't go to that. It's not necessarily that we woke up one day and we're like, oh, you know what? Like we... Like we have such a heart for, at least for me, it's not like, oh, I have such a heart for education. I love education. Who doesn't want to be educated? But it's also that portion of like, there's, there's a missing element in our education. And I don't know that anyone other than the church is ever going to recognize. Well, I do know that nobody except the church is ever going to recognize that that element of Christ in our education, hope in our education needs to be restored. And, um, and to think that this wasn't a deliberate move by the enemy over the years yeah to erode this now in in my military background in my you know um it, it, you know i read a lot of uh, military texts and i listen to a lot of uh, ex-military guys and podcasts and stuff so i still have a, a big pride in that i still have a lot of um i probably use a lot of terms i don't even realize it but this was a strategic move, mm-hmm. you know, by the enemy many years ago. And That's it right. has eroded That's right. what made America great. I hate yeah. using a, somebody else's catchphrase, but, <laughs> you know, this, it's not horrible. Wait, are we going to make America great again? We we might. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even, even if we... even uh, Too big to cheat, I think. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I, so if this was a strategic plan by the enemy, and uh, yeah, I'm talking about Satan. I think this, this, there's you can draw the line directly to this. You erode the education, which will eventually erode the family, and the family is the the strongest unit of government that exists, um, a biblical family, and we're just gorillas in this fight. We are we are the guerrilla warfare. We are the insurgency we are fighting back against what has been established there's a stronghold and and we are we're no we're tired of being civilians in this fight we yeah. want to engage and that's what we're doing yeah amen dude awesome yeah well brother i think we've gone long enough if you had anything that you could tell everybody if there was one thing that you really wanted to communicate to um to the whoever's going to watch this, um, whether the curious person or the supporter or whatever, like what would be the message you would want to get across? That's an on the spot question. I really want people to grab that analogy. Mm -hmm. And I really want people to recognize that there is a cliff in front of, 
anyone who comes through our institution. And you can apply it so well across your life. But if you if you turn your mind to that and you realize that 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 children's lives are on the line, and if that doesn't do it for you, you cannot have a successful country. Your government, mm. I'm not pleased with the way things are going right now. Mm. But we're not going to make a change with those that are in office. We are going to make a change by starting to we, we have to play the long game like we're no longer playing checkers we're playing chess we're, we're playing a proactive game we're not playing a reactive game and if you want to change the country if you want to like whatever your driving factor is it doesn't matter if you get if you get the gravity of 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 the abyss that is in front of your neighbor your your neighbor's kids whatever if you get the gravity of that that's one thing that drove it home for me i also want to restore pride in our government i want that and i don't think it'll come without the lord being involved so if i had one final thing if you want to change the country if you want to help grow the church body and the army of christ if you just have a heart for kids and want to save them then you've got to get on board with us mm -hmm. and i don't mean us salt and light although i would love for you to be on board with salt and light i mean us the church, us, the movement. Like it's not, we've talked and those that have gone to the vision tour have seen that phase four, it's not about us. We want to build this model up and we want to give it away. Yeah. I don't, like money is obviously not the issue. Like it's not a, it's not a, it's not about what we can get. It's not even about the students. It's about the impact that we can have. And it's about the long-term it's about the long-term effects. If we want something to call home America, this, this religious, free, Christian-based, you know, the values that the, the Christian values that this country was based on, if you want any semblance of that in the future, you've got to start today. And you got to start now. Amen. Brother, good stuff. And uh, man, just to, to to add to that, like I think that phase four is so important. For us to recognize, for anybody watching to recognize that, you know, our goal in this is not just to gather up as many kids as we can. You know, we talked about earlier, like having 500 kids all week, but the, the goal is not just to have 500 kids all week because there's 50 million yeah. that are going to school across America. Yeah. And, and I also know that there are thousands, tens of thousands of churches that if they grasp a hold of the, the cliff, yeah. that they're going to be in the place that we are today saying, how in the world do we do this? And so for us to have this phase four to say our goal is to, is to begin a foundation to help other churches do this, that goal is a further reaching goal than our four walls of a church. Or, you know, should the Lord willing build us a standalone building um, that, you know, we have students in this school complex um, that's not enough. We have to take that further. Right. And so to be able to help those churches, to be able to say, look, this is how we did it. This is our foundation. This is where we can help. This is where we, can, this is what we can help you to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly we would love if there was a foundation right now that we could call and say, okay, help us. And they'd yeah. be like, all right, here's some steps. Here's yeah. some things. We would love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think in the same way, you know, for us to be able to, to uh, further that and put that out there in, in such a way for others to be able to latch onto, that's the important thing is, you know, there's an impact for the kingdom. There's an impact for our own country. There's an impact for our own community. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, there's going to be an impact for our own churches. Yeah. And that's really, that's really the whole thing is we're going to start in the church, but that's going to be a growing yeah. That's going to be a growing thing. Yeah. So, brother, man, I appreciate your time today. I think that was enough for everybody to chew on. What, what do we got? An hour and eight minutes. Not so, uh, yeah. All right. Well, hope you guys enjoy it. And we'll probably, you'll probably be back a lot because you're um, headmaster now. Yeah, headmaster, <laughs> head of school, head minister. I'm all of those things. And I'm excited to see where this goes. I, we'll call this a starting point. This is, this is the podcast. This is the kickoff. Um, but uh, I'm excited to see what the Lord does. And now we've got a record, and now we've, we've begun. You know, right. We've started some motion. So I appreciate you Amen, brother. taking the time. Good stuff. See you.